Okay then. Well, it seems that we are live for space. Okay then. Well, it seems that we are live, <laughs> and we have a bit of a delay, and a duplication as well. It's always entertaining when we're going live with the uh, interwebs and so on. We're going to bring in Mark McCorkran, and you can't expect begin. your team to manage work with this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Mark. A few. All right, I'm a ventriloquist. What can I do? You know. Indeed. Well, I assume that. Uh, that you've connected okay tonight. Um, and, and how are you doing? A pleasure to see you again. Yeah, I'm good. Good, thank you. Um, got my new, slightly new technical setup, new webcam and some lights and a big green screen behind me. So uh, hopefully shinier and newer than ever before, but well, probably you get to see how old I am now as well. But. Uh, optimal shininess. And uh, well, speaking of shiny objects, Mark, you've picked a uh, you are a man after my own heart. A, a pretty fantastic background there. Um, so, so why have you chosen that? And uh, well, what film might you be referencing? Well, indeed. So this, of course, is this Discovery One from 2001 A Space Odyssey and also 2010, uh, which came after. And uh, it's in orbit around Jupiter. Um, and these are three of uh, Jupiter's uh, large, what we call Galilean satellites. So Galileo, with his very first telescope, was able to look at Jupiter and spot four moons uh, going around Jupiter. And, you know, that was very important in our understanding of um, the heliocentric um, solar system we live in, that the sun's in the middle and that not everything's going around the Earth because these satellites were whizzing around Jupiter. A little known fact, actually, about, about 2001 A Space Odyssey is that uh, the original intention uh, is that they end up at Saturn, but when they tried to do the special effects for Saturn and the rings and so on, they just didn't look very good. So in the film, they switched it to going to Jupiter instead. Well, well how very disappointing indeed. <laughs> All that said, um, you know, I think like a lot of people who perhaps don't come from a uh, background uh, in, uh, well, all the fields that are related to the fantastic mission we're about to speak to tonight. Um, the reason why I think Jupiter, among many other reasons, occupies a popular imagination, for me at least, is of course 2010, you know, a film that, you know, focuses so squarely on, well, one of the moons, of course. And um, I mean, Europa is not the only moon that we're looking at with this mission, of course, but tell us a bit what that's all about and who's going to be joining us tonight. Yeah, so, you know, for all that we've sent fictional spacecraft there, a number of real spacecraft have gone there. Um, Voyager uh, probes both went past Jupiter. Galileo has gone, uh, the Pioneer probe, uh, at least one of them, uh, went past Jupiter early on in the space age. But then Galileo came and went into orbit around Jupiter, um, had a fantastic mission there, somewhat compromised by the fact that its main antenna, its, its high gain antenna, didn't open fully, so not all the data back that we might have wanted. Uh, but there's a mission there currently as well called Juno, which is studying uh, Jupiter in great detail. But for us, it's this mission, as we'll hear from our guests, this mission called JUICE, it's in the acronym, Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. Um, and the real focus of the mission is these three uh, Galilean satellites. So from the top, that's Europa, um, and then second is Callisto, and at the bottom is Ganymede. Uh, the fourth Galilean satellite is Io, and it won't be a focus, and we'll talk about why, why Io is different today. But these moons all have icy crusts of water ice and underneath those crusts we believe there are liquid water oceans uh, in some cases very deep uh, maybe interspersed with other ice layers and so on and rocky cores at the bottom of that and that's what juice is really focused on uh, this mission which we've been building for a number of years now nearly 10 years um, and is due for launch next year so it's great to have a couple of guests on this evening who know all about that we're going to have michelle doherty who is a space physicist, uh, currently the head of physics at Imperial College in London. Um, she's had a background in the Cassini mission that went to uh, Saturn and made discoveries there. And she's a PI, uh, principal investigator of one of the instruments uh, on the JUICE mission. And then from the ESA side, we have Olivier Vitas, and Olivier is the ESA project scientist for the JUICE mission. He's been involved in lots of other missions that we've had over the years. He's been with us for 20 years. Um, so we've got lots of sort of comparative planetology to talk about. You know, why Jupiter? Why not this? Why the other? Great guests to tell us all about JUICE and where we are before we embark on the mission at, uh, next year. Indeed. Well, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating moment for us all. And, uh, you know, I said it before, Mark, 
just an absolutely thrilling moment for discovery all across the board. And, uh, you know, to think that we have this to look forward to among so many other things is uh, really, I guess, just cause for a lot of optimism. <clears throat> Olivia and Michelle, how are you doing? Are you receiving? Yes, thank you. All yep. good. Very well. Good evening. Very good. I, I I don't know if you heard my introduction. I hope I got it right. But uh, what, what I said about you. But uh, we'll we'll keep the personal things for later on. <laughs> well, you know, I I think in the um, the world of literature and screenwriting, you've just created a Chekhov's gun, Mark. You can't just bring that out there <laughs> without us to return to. So um, so yeah, that will come up in I guess the banter. Well, first things first, we have a lot to talk about, um, but. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you both here. And I guess to frame the conversation, Michelle, um, I just want to ask you perhaps a bit provocatively now, um, you know, we've already got things like Galileo and Juno. Why are we going back? Why all this interest? What's it all about? Um, Alex, what we want to do is we want to focus mainly on the moons of Jupiter that we are almost certain have got liquid water underneath the surface of this. And for that, you really, uh, Ganymede in particular, you really need to go into orbit. And so that's why we want to go back. You know, the previous spacecraft, from my perspective, they were almost um, the, first, the first explorers. And they decided where or they found where was best to further explore. And that's what we're going to be doing with JUICE. So let me follow up with a, a sort of a detailed question immediately. In my backdrop, I've got... Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede, and Io isn't in there. So what? Why is Io not a focus? It's another big moon as well. Is it not? Is it not interesting as well? Um, Mark, it certainly is interesting. Um, it almost certainly doesn't have liquid water underneath the surface, though. And really, the focus of Juice is to try and understand whether the th three moons we're looking at have got the ingredients for life perhaps to form. So we're essentially focusing on potential habitability at the moment. Okay. Um, and one good thing about not focusing on IO is that the radiation environment around IO is very scary and the spacecraft wouldn't last long. <laughs> yeah, so let me let me you know drag that across to Olivier because that's a very important part about this mission. You know, some people look at juice and say, um, isn't the obvious target for a European space agency mission to go to Europa uh, rather than Ganymede? Um, but uh, there are technical reasons why Europa's hard and Io's even harder. So talk us through some of that, Olivier. What are the, the challenges that, which are specific to Jupiter? You know, these moons are just not sitting there in a kind of empty space, so to speak. There's, there's something, there's a big thing which connects them to Jupiter. Yeah, so the, in fact, the main challenge of the mission well, we have many challenges, but the main one is probably the radiation environment. Because Jupiter, we have the, the biggest magnetic field, very fast rotating magnetic field. We have Io, uh, which is a very active moon, which sends some particles into the system. So we have a very hard uh, radiation environment. And uh, our spacecraft is made of uh, electronics, sensitive uh, detectors, and so on. So if you send a spacecraft without any protection, as Michel said, it will not survive long. And the closer you are to Jupiter, the, the harsher it is. So in distance, we have, uh, well, from Jupiter, we have Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So the two closest one, Io and, and Europa, they are a bit too close for, for, for us here with respect to the radiation environment. So uh, that's why we, we prefer to focus on, the, on Callisto and Ganymede, of course. So that's the main, the main problem. If we will have, uh, uh, from the technical point of view, the capability to build a spacecraft which is very well protected, I mean, with an additional budget, uh, et cetera, et cetera, then we could afford probably a mission there. But with the European capability and our budget, we can afford a mission uh, reasonably to uh, mainly to Ganymede. Okay. And, and also, Mark, if I may follow up on that, you know, it's always a balance between, yes, we could fly a mission that could protect the spacecraft and the instruments from a harsh radiation environment. But because of the mass of that, it means we would fly less instruments to be able to do that. And... Uh, I think we've got the perfect number of instruments to do the science that we want to do. And I would say that, of course. Well, that's why that's why we didn't ask any of the engineers on. They just, you know, they would fly no <laughs> instruments, right? That would be much easier. Just just get there with the spacecraft job done. 
Alex, <laughs> let me let me hand it back to you. Well, I mean, if, if, we could, um, if we could talk about the spacecraft for a second now, um, you know, uh, I might be oversimplifying, but it's pretty easy to get there, right? It, it's just point A to point B, um, and it goes in a straight line. I mean, describe the journey there, right? Because it, it, it it's empty space, right? How does it work? Shall I do that, uh, Michel? Go for it, Olivier. Go for it. Oh, okay. So. Uh, when we yes, when we go to point A to point B, the yes, usually you would like to do to go to the via the straight line, but in space is not is not that easy. Uh, if we will go directly from uh, from Earth to Jupiter, we will need a small spacecraft and a big rocket. This is, what, for example, what happened with uh, uh, with New Horizon when they they passed to Jupiter in one year, just from Earth to Jupiter. They have a very small spacecraft and a very powerful rocket. So with Juice, which is a big spacecraft, something like six tons, and the capability of Ion 5, it's a great uh, launcher, but uh, I mean, we have also some uh, limitation in performance. So we, we cannot go directly to Jupiter. So we need to use the technique called gravity assist. So we'll use the, we will do some flyby of uh, planets like Earth and Venus uh, to get more uh, uh, energy and velocity to be able to reach Jupiter. So instead of going uh, via the straight line, we'll do something like four orbits uh, around the, the, the sun and it will take, uh, it takes between uh, seven and uh, nine years. And Alex, my heart sinks because I work out how old I'm going to be when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. But you know, we have to be patient uh, when we work in, in planetary mission. Yeah. I know it's not one of my strengths. <laughs> I think this is a very important point to bring across, actually. Um, and we talked about this earlier in the week, Olivier. I remember seeing a talk by uh, Ed Stone uh, a number of years ago, perhaps 10 years ago. And of course, he was famously involved in the Voyager missions, which launched in 1977 and reached both reached Jupiter pretty quickly. Um, Voyager 2 then went to um, Saturn and then on to Uranus and Neptune. Um, but they got there quickly. Um, and, and yet everything we seem to do today is so slow and it takes seven years to get to Mercury and it takes seven or nine years to get to Jupiter. The point being, of course, is that we want to stop. It's not just about flying past things at high speed, because if you if you do go fast and you carry all that fuel, you use the fuel at the beginning to go fast, you've got to slow down again. So it's not just about using the planets to to kind of give us energy it's about putting us on a trajectory which allows us to do a rendezvous at the end um, and so again you know kind of the, I wouldn't say the easy things were done in the early days not at all but it's taking longer now because we want to stop so Michelle let, let's jump to you because of course you were involved in a, one of these very long uh, planetary missions uh, the Cassini Huygens mission um, so talk us through that you know that was a long journey too to get to Saturn because it stopped um, and of course, you were very famously involved in the magnetometer experiment as the PI of that, uh, which then discovered something very interesting about the moon Enceladus. Yes. Um, and, and, and in fact, Mark, I see juice almost as a way of paying back my involvement in Cassini, because I was quite fortunate. I wasn't involved in building the instrument on Cassini at all. I only became involved after the spacecraft was launched. Um, and in some ways, the, one of the things, sorry, I'm, I'm going back to Juice, but one of the things I found really interesting about Juice is the involvement with the engineers and the spacecraft provider. It's a very different dynamic at the start of the mission when you're designing and building the instrument. But yeah, for Cassini, it was first thought about back in the early 1980s. Um, the instruments were selected in the early 90s, and then they were built over about a period of six and a half years. The launch took place in 1997. It took us six and a half years to get to Saturn. Um, and then we were going to orbit around Saturn for a four year period. That was the sort of nominal uh, first part of the mission. But because of the discoveries that were made, the spacecraft was, was healthy, the instruments were doing really well. The mission kept being extended and extended. And the mission end was when we burnt up in the atmosphere of Saturn. Um, but for me, I think the most exciting thing that we did was, as you mentioned, Mark, we um, we had a flyby past one of the moons called Enceladus, a small moon. Um, we didn't expect to see much. And what we found was that there was something that was causing the magnetic field of Saturn to, to drape around the moon. We couldn't 
the field lines that we saw from Saturn weren't able to go right down onto the surface. And so we postulated that there was an atmosphere there. And in fact, it wasn't an atmosphere covering the entire moon, but there was this outgassing of a water vapor plume at the South Pole. And we had lots more flybys of Enceladus. We found there was organic material in the plume. There was liquid water under the surface. There was a heat source. And so we had three of the four ingredients that we think you need for life to form in the solar system. And that's liquid water, it's a heat source and it's organic material. The fourth thing we need is for those first three things to be stable enough over a long enough period of time that something's going to actually happen. But uh, um, yeah, my favorite moon used to be Enceladus. Now I'm changing my focus to Ganymede. <laughs> and, and I think the important thing for people to realize is, you know, tend to think of these moons as, you know, sort of all of the same kind. I, I obviously didn't put Enceladus on this picture, but Enceladus is, you know, roughly 10 times smaller yes. than Ganymede in diameter. So it's a way smaller moon in all sorts of ways. And so, you know, do we, Olivia, do we really expect that Ganymede, Callisto and, and Europa will be the same as Enceladus or is, you know, did they form the same way or is there a diversity in their structures because it's all about the gravity and the pressures and everything else. So what do we, what, you know, what do we think we know in advance going to these moons? Well, what is interesting in the, in the, in, well, in any system, but in particular in the Jupiter system is that these four Galilean moons, they are very, very different from each other. Yeah. So if we have, uh, so we mentioned Io, so that's the most active uh, moon, maybe placed in the in the solar system with this I, I, ac active volcano. That's the word I wanted to hear from you, right? I mean, it's volcanoes of all things, yeah. right? Crazy. So that's a very uh, an atypical uh, world, and that creates a lot of activity in the system. As we said, we it um, it replenished the the magnetosphere. Then we have Europa, which is very interesting because it's a it's a small icy moon, so the size of uh, of our moon. Uh, with also an active surface, uh, ice, and uh, inside the uh, subsurface ocean, which is in contact with the rocky mantle. So it's a very interesting place for astrobiology. Yeah. Then we have uh, uh, Ganymede, which is our main target. And that's the biggest moon of the solar system. So a kind of mini planet bigger than Mercury. Also, we have good evidence that there is a lot of liquid water, maybe more liquid water in Ganymede than on Earth. So if you can make a comparison plus an internal magnetic field, which is very rare if you consider solid bodies. And it's interesting to have a magnetic field. For example, on Earth, we are very happy with our magnetic field uh, from, for some reasons. <laughs> well, we'll have to, you, you can talk about that in a minute, why it is, again, yes. for our audience. Yeah, but and, on, then, uh, and then we have Callisto, which is then the, the much further away. Small is more or less the same size of Ganymede, so a mini planet. But if you look at the surface, there is no activity. It's like our moon, maybe a dead from the geological point of view. But we'll also think that there might be also liquid water inside. Here, the question, there is still a question mark. So all the moons are very different. If you look for activity, you, you are pretty much interested in Io and Europa. If you are looking in ocean world, you are interested by uh, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. If you are looking for for uh, geology and um, earlier history of the system, it's uh, Callisto because that's the same image as four billion years ago. If you are looking for um, habitability, it's uh, Europa and Ganymede and potential for life, it's better for Europa. So you see uh, all the moons are very different, very interesting to study. And with Zeus, we are going to really to focus on, uh, on Ganymede, but with also with a view on Callisto and Europa to compare to understand the differences, the similarities, and to get a better idea about the habitability in those systems. I mean, if I could ask, um, it's, a, it's a word that's come up a few times um, this evening. When we talk about habitability, um, you know, I mean, just like, you know, just like environments that, you know, potentially support life. I mean, how broad a spectrum is that exactly? I mean, because obviously we're not looking at something that is Earth-like, you know, in any sense, but, but what does that term mean for people that aren't as familiar perhaps as as, as uh, the rest of our company is tonight. Uh, Olivier, do you want to have oh, a first? Michelle, Michelle, I thought you were thinking of that, so uh, uh, you go, go ahead. It's always good to see who, who takes the time to answer. Who wants it? Michelle, I was going to give it to you. Go on. Um, from my perspective, habitability means it's an environment where life can form. Um, 
not necessarily life as, as, as we think of ourselves, but life of some kind. So bacteria, um, you know, similar to the kind of bacteria that we find in the deep oceans on the earth. We think the ingredients there are very similar to what might be happening in the oceans of Europa as well. And so it's, I, I, I think with, with, with juice, when we, when we made the case to the European Space Agency that we should fly juice, we were really careful that we didn't say we wanted to find life, because I think that's pushing it too far. We want to find the, whether the conditions are there so that life can form. And that's the sort of subtle sort of difference in a way. Yeah. So let me pick up on that detail, because Olivia kind of hinted at this. Europa, currently, the thinking is that Europa has an icy crust, a liquid ocean, and then the next layer down is rock. And so that yep. allows liquid water to come into contact with minerals and mm -hmm. potentially energy sources, which might be driven by the tidal forces from, from Jupiter. Whereas Ganymede, if I, if, and I haven't done my, my, my reading, but this is my memory, is that Ganymede is thought to be ice, water, ice, rock. Um, and so there wouldn't be that mineral mixing. But that opens the bigger question. So, Olivia, how do we even know any of this? Uh, and, and, and what's juice actually going to do? Because it's not going to land on the surface of these things and drill a hole in them and go sample water. Right. I mean, what, what happened in Enceladus? And we also know that Europa has got some water coming out from it now. But at Ganymede, how, how will we even probe the water if we don't dig beneath that ice and find it? How do we know this and what's juice going to add to it? Yeah, it's very interesting to uh, to understand how we can probe the interior of a planet or a moon from uh, from an orbiter. Because indeed, as you said, we're not going to land, we are not going to drill, that may be for the future missions. Uh, so with juice, we, we have an orbiter that will orbit uh, Ganymede at uh, different altitude, for example, 500 kilometers during the last part of the mission. And on board, we have many instruments which, from which uh, we will be able to, to, uh, to know more about the interior of the, of the moon. And that's very interesting. If I can give you some example, well, we have the magnetometer from Michel. Michel can talk about that much better than me. And with the magnetometer, we'll get information on the core and on the subsurface ocean, uh, because it's very interesting to, to understand that we can probe the existence of liquid water with a magnetic field. Maybe Michel can come back to that later. It's a quite an interesting uh, uh, sure. topic in physics. Then we have what we call uh, radio science. So we will uh, use the telecommunications uh, signal of the spacecraft uh, back to Earth, from which we can measure the, some properties like the Doppler shift of the signal. And then we can get uh, the very precise uh, trajectory reconstruction. And if you know precisely the trajectory, you, kind of, uh, you can get an information on the gravity field. And if you get information on the gravity field, you, you can get an idea of what the, the interior is made of. Then we have a laser altimeter, which will uh, measure the, the, the distance between juice and the surface. And then we can get the idea of the topography of the moon. And if the, the moon uh, uh, change shapes due to the tidal effect, we can also measure that with the, our altimeter. And then you can get information on the interior because how much movement we can see. For example, do we see tides of one meter or 10 meters, 20 meters? Uh, that, that, that's, you will give it, that will give you information whether there is a liquid underneath the crust. Because the crust move, will move differently whether the crust is sitting above liquid water or sitting a bit, uh, above something solid. You can understand that the, the surface will move differently. So we have this kind of, uh, of experiment that can give us information on the interior. We have a subsurface radar that will give access to the first, let's say, 10 kilometers, so the ice layers. It's also quite, uh, quite important. And we have some uh, uh, remote sensing instrument that will uh, give us information on the surface properties. And if you study the surface, you can also get information on the interior. There are some exchange between the interior and the surface. And in addition, we have all the scientists who knows how to model the interior of a moon, of a planet. So they, they, they simulate what's, what could be a possibility for the interior, and then we compare with data. It's a full process, which is quite interesting. So we can, the bottom line is we can, uh, from orbit, even from 500 kilometers altitude, we can get information on the interior, which is quite uh, interesting to, uh, to think about. So, so before we jump to Michelle and the magnetometer part, just you know, to illustrate what you said, if you think about the tides on the Earth, 
the water goes up and down a lot mm-hmm. more than the rocks go up and down, but they're going up and down as well. They flex because the moon yep. is passing over them, but but they're much more rigid, so they don't move that much. And equally, the the Arctic Ocean, the ice on top of that moves up and down with the water, but the ice in Antarctica moves much less because the, the land underneath it's not moving so much. So, so Michelle, tell us a bit about the magnetic fields. I mean, you know, look, for any everybody, you know the classical thing in astrophysics or, you know, you just want to make anything obscure and, and just fob people off and say, oh, it's magnetic fields, because none of us actually understand magnetic fields, right? Should be I mean, short. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, you know, magnetic fields, what the hell is it, right? I mean, take a bar magnet and put it, I mean, what is it's magic, man, magnetic fields. So, so how do you go about measuring what's going on remotely i mean you're not sticking a bar magnet or anything so what's the actual yeah. measurement technique and what can how how can you tell the difference between water and rock and ice and all of these things by the magnetic field okay well what my instrument does is you're right mark it measures the magnetic field lines which we can't actually see um and i'll follow up on your idea of a bar magnet um and when I give talks at schools and things, what I say is that if, 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 if we were standing on the surface of the Earth or on the surface of Ganymede, it would be very similar. Um, and if we could see the field lines that were being generated in the interior, the way you can think about it, you've got a piece of paper, you put a bar magnet underneath a piece of paper and you put iron filings on top. Those iron filings will lie along the lines of force of the magnet. And those are the field lines, essentially. And those field lines rotate at the same rate that the planet rotates. And so as we're flying past Jupiter or Ganymede, we will be flying through these field lines and we'll be measuring their strength and their direction. We've got three different instruments to do it. Uh, We've got uh, one halfway down the, the, the long mag boom that we have, and then two right at the end. And the one right at the tip only measures the magnitude of the field. And so that allows us to resolve it to really high, um, to really high accuracy. Um, the, the way in which we can see inside Ganymede is Ganymede has got a liquid ocean and it's got a salt content in it so that the water's got a conductivity. Um, and so if, if as Ganymede is, it's embedded in the background magnetic field of Jupiter that is changing all the time. And as it's moving through that changing field, it's going to generate a current that flows in the liquid water ocean. And that current generates a magnetic field of its own. And that's the field that we can measure. And and, and in fact, to be, to be frank, what I lose sleep over is whether once we get to Ganymede, we're going to be able to resolve all of these different fields. We've got the background magnetic field of Jupiter that's changing all the time. We've got the internal dynamo field of Ganymede. We're embedded in this big current sheet, which has got lots of plasma flowing in it. And oh, by the way, we've got to measure these induction signatures as well. And so when I lose sleep, that's what I lose sleep over, I must confess. So, so for my, before we jump back to Alex, for my understanding for the future, because I've never actually thought about the, 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 the numbers here, how much bigger is Jupiter's magnetic field at Ganymede than Ganymede's field is at 500 kilometers? Is it, are we talking, you know, factors of one or two or is it thousands? I just have no idea. It's not, it's not a leading question. It's just, I just don't know. Uh, if I can remember off the top of my head, the magnetic field of Jupiter at Ganymede orbit is about 800 nanotesla, I think. Nanotesla is the measurement that we use. Um, the Ganymede field is of order three or four hundred nanotesla, the, in, the, the internal field. But then we've got fields that have been generated as a, as a result of plasma currents flowing in this big sort of plasma sheet. That's of order 20 to 30 nanotesla. And the induction signatures that we're looking for are half to one sort of nanotesla so the way that i see it is it's and you know the sizes are changing all the time and so the way that i see it is we're trying to find lots of needles in the haystack that are changing color and shape all the time yeah <laughs> so that's why i lose sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well you, you could have proposed a camera michelle i mean it wouldn't life would have been much easier. yeah but you know <laughs> you know Lots of people propose cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. We will, we will manage. We will manage, uh, Michel. <laughs> we 
will. And, and, and you know, that's what we're doing at the moment is we, we've built the instrument that's going to let us do that. We just need to make sure that we calibrate it properly so that we know exactly what we're seeing. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, you said it, but just to, you know, belabor the point, that your instrument's way down the end of a very long stick pointing away yes. from the spacecraft because the spacecraft itself is generating magnetic fields. I mean, it's got yes. electronics in it. It's got moving parts. Um, so yeah. how long is that boom again, roughly? I'm just... It's 10.6 meters. Because right. I think I've seen it here at Aztec when it was deployed. I mean, yeah. I forgot to say that at the beginning. The whole spacecraft is here currently you yeah. know, uh, near us here in the Netherlands in the test chamber going through its thermovac test now. So cryovac test. I think it's been pumped down. I don't know if it's cold yet, Olivier. Maybe you can talk us through a little bit of the status of the spacecraft in the test chamber at the moment. Yeah, no, the... the... We have a one month uh, test, as you said, thermal vacuum test. Uh, it started 15 days ago and it will stop in 15 days. So we are right in the middle, in fact. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a cold at the moment and we are checking uh, the, the cold conditions and later at the end of the test, the warm conditions. So we will uh, um, switch on an artificial uh, sun that will simulate the conditions at Venus because during the cruise phase, we will fly by Venus. Yeah. So we'll check really the cold and the, and the warm conditions to make sure that the thermal design is, uh, is correct. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy, easy, easy work because the spectrograph is designed to work at Jupiter where it's cold. And during the cruise, it will be uh, fly by Venus and it will be in the inner solar system where the conditions are not optimum for, for juice. Right. So, uh, but uh, we have a, a great uh, project and engineers that uh, made a good design. And so far, the test is, uh, is proceeding very, very well. So so cold, cold and warm. I just love the statement "warm at Venus." You know, as if it's a nice, warm, sunny day. So give us, give us some of the numbers there. Cold means what, and warm means what? What are the extremes we're testing to? Why well, it's basically minus two hundred degrees and plus uh, two hundred degrees, something like that. Okay. So that's that's the range of temperature that in, we're in, we are talking in, about in Celsius. Yeah, yeah, in Celsius. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just, just with, of course, with numbers like 115 on the news in Canada at the moment, uh, that's Fahrenheit. That doesn't mean it's very nice <laughs> for humans, but you would not want to be in that chamber uh, at, at, at juice temperatures. That's, no. that's the key thing. I mean, um, I wondered if we could flip back because I mean, Mark made a really, you know, fascinating reference to you know Aztec, which perhaps not everybody's familiar with, and so on. I mean, to give a sense of like the scale of this mission, um, you know, so nine years to get there, but. How long to actually build it to get it to this point? And and when we when you say we, how many people is we? Is it it's just you two, right? <laughs> no, no. So in fact, uh, we, we we mentioned we have to be patient when we work in planetary missions. So just to to give the full uh, the full schedule the the call for for ID when that we released uh, recently uh, regularly in ESA when we want to have a new mission was was released in 2007 for this mission. It took five years to be uh, to be uh, to be accepted, selected. Uh, it was a complicated process. We were with NASA. There were multiple studies and so on. So five years to be accepted, and uh, and then we started the um, studies with the industry. And the full project started in 2015, and the spacecraft is due to launch in 2022. So you see something like a seven years of uh, of project, uh, but before five years of studies, yeah. and then seven, eight, nine years to uh, to to cruise in the solar system, five years of uh, of mission, and then 20, 30 years of uh, 50 years of data analysis. <laughs> by the scientific community. Uh, but all in all, the, the project itself is something like 30 years. Uh, it's yeah. like the big mission like cassini huygens uh, Galileo and so on. So we have to be very patient. So it's an interesting af aspect of, of a project. And when you mention how many people, so again, it's difficult to say we have, a, uh, because we, we have all the, uh, the PI teams so the scientists who built and deliver the, the hardware. So we have 11, in, uh, 11 teams, so 10 instruments, but 11, 11 teams. Uh, each team, I mean, it's between uh, uh, 50 and, and 200 people mm -hmm. um, easily. Then some teams are supported by the, in, by the industry. Uh, in terms of spacecraft, we have a project team, uh, which is something like 20, 30 people in STEC. Uh, we have also people in ESOC that will control the spacecraft. Uh, it's a small team at the moment, five, 10 people. At ISAC in Spain, we have a team which will uh, um, uh, work on the instrument planning. 
again, five people at the moment. And then behind, we have a huge industrial consortium, which built the spacecraft, all the parts in it, very, uh, very, very, very complicated project. The prime industry is in, is in Toulouse, uh, with also together with, um, with Airbus in, in, in Germany. And here it's a thousand of people. So, uh, so yeah, it's a big, uh, it's a big project. And, and Alex, I think what's important to um, for the teams to do is to make sure that we have quite a few young people on the teams because it takes a while to get there. Um, and we, you know, on, on my team, I'm training up some young scientists who will be able to uh, take over some of the running of the instrument once we get there and we'll do some of the science. But But also I think... What I find most spectacular about JUICE is that we have built the instruments and the spacecraft in lockdown, essentially. Some of my engineers were doing some of the uh, fine tuning of our sensors on their kitchen tables when they couldn't get into <laughs> our labs, you know. So that for me is really spectacular, you know. Mm. <clears throat> So, you, you know, we often talk uh, science fiction here uh, on Space Rocks and the idea of generation ships come up, you know, how you make get to the nearest stars. We're already building generation ships, right? Because you took over from the PI uh, of MAG and you will probably not, I don't know, I mean, academics never retire, but, um, but you will probably hand off responsibilities at some point during the mission. And that person then may go on to be the PI of a new mission beyond that. So that, that, that training, that generational interchange is, is a critical part uh, in these missions. But I, I, I did want to bring up, you mentioned the word there, um, Olivier, going back in history, um, JUICE came from a bunch of studies which were 50-50 missions uh, with NASA. Um, uh, Laplace was this mission, which was going to Jupiter. And at the same time, there was a proposal, a joint European-American mission called Tandem to go back to Saturn and to Titan. Um, now, politics happens, and, and that collaboration on Laplace didn't work out. That's why the name went away, in a sense. Um, but NASA are involved in this mission. Uh, they have uh, one of the instruments. So I'd like you to talk about that a little bit, Olivier. And also um, the, the fact that NASA is also going back to the Jupiter system uh, with Europa Clipper. Um, so even though it's not one package anymore, they will be working together. Um, and so talk us through that, the, the, the US involvement in JUICE and then the US European collaboration if, if there's enough overlap when we get to yeah, yeah. so the yes so there is a, a strong uh, us involvement in juice they provide one full instrument which is the uv spectrometer so to look at the uh, aurora at jupiter for example the aurora at ganymede surface composition as well so a very uh, very uh, very excellent uh, instrument and the the pi is from nasa nasa also contributing to uh, two other instrument like a, a plasma package and also to the to the radar, to the subsurface radar. So we have really a very strong involvement of, of NASA. So to come back to history, yes, there was this uh, this joint study uh, that will uh, have involved two spacecraft, one going to uh, to Europa and one going to Ganymede. It was stopped due to the NASA stopped this uh, this study, and you and Europe went alone, and we we continue with our focus on Ganymede. And then a few years ago, from the NASA side, uh, they resuscitated the, the project and they started the Europa Clipper uh, mission. And they will launch, I think, some, somewhere in uh, sometimes in 2023, 24. I think it's more 24. So there is really uh, likely that we, uh, there will be an overlap between the two missions, which, uh, which I think is great. So they will focus on Europa. And we focus on Ganymede, and we do also uh, Callisto, a bit of Europa, and the Jupiter system. But I think that uh, it's clear that uh, the two spacecraft will be working together. And we start already to think uh, what could be the collaboration. So we have regular changes between the two teams uh, to make sure that uh, well, we know each other and we will work together when we are there. So, But it's quite independent project, so we are not going to plan the observations uh, jointly. Right? It's too complicated. Every project goes independently, which is better. And then we will join force when we are there. We'll, we will combine the data. Uh, we'll discuss together. And what could uh, um, could happen, which I hope very well, is that at the end of the of the mission uh, for Juice, it will be an impact on Ganymede. And for Europa Clipper, it could be also an impact on Ganymede or on another moon. So it might well be that uh, one spacecraft will hit uh, Ganymede while the other 
will be uh, watching the event with the remote sensing instrument. So that could be an interesting end. <laughs> And f we can get also, it, there, there is also, of course, the fun aspect to look at spacecraft uh, impacting uh, uh, a moon, but also there is some science benefit uh, from it. So that could be like we have other mission, deep impact or L cross at the moon. Mm. Uh, so that could be an interesting end for, for one of the mission and the other mission witnessing the, this event. Now, you know, the... and, and, and sorry, sorry, ahead. Mark, just a, just, just a quick point. And there's also an overlap on team on team members on the different instruments on the two spacecraft um the magnetometer team on clipper for example i've got some of those people on my team on juice and so there is an overlap anyway as far as the kind of science that we're going to be doing together okay. uh, alex you go ahead I, i'll bring my my question will come up again so uh you, you jump in well i mean I, I wondered if we could just like flip back to the kitchen table um you know, <laughs> this is this is you know I've seen the movies. This is not what space looks like. I mean, uh, you know, kitchen tables and all that kind of thing. I mean, those are some incredibly unique challenges. I suppose not just from an engineering standpoint, getting the table big enough, but also um, in terms of internal comms and all that. I mean, what were the unique challenges of doing this in the lockdown? Because I'm fascinated that you're able to push it forward um, throughout all of these uh, all these unique challenges. I think I think Alex, I, I I can speak for the instrument that we built. Maybe maybe Olivier wants to follow up as far as the spacecraft was concerned. But um, we were really fortunate at, at at Imperial College when we were told that we had to lock down in March 2020. We slowly started reopening our research labs in June, and so. The engineers had access to the labs, but we had to be really careful, only one person in the lab at a time and things like that. And so what they were able to do is the bits they built on their kitchen table were those parts where we didn't need a clean room to be able to do it. Um, and so it was really um, the oversight of my lead engineer, you know, he had to make sure the people were working on different bits of the instrument at the same time, but we could bring them all together at the right time. And so we knew that we didn't want to delay juice. We wanted to go to Jupiter. And we were concerned that if we didn't keep the building up during the lockdown, that we just weren't going to make the deadlines. But I'm, I'm so excited by the fact we've been able to do it. The fact that the spacecraft is in TB in the TB TV chamber now, it's, you know, it's amazing. It really is. Sure is. And so Olivier, when we went down to lockdown at Aztec, priority was given to Juice because, of course, it is about launch windows. It's about you can't just, you know, fly it when you want. Uh, there are specific times when the planets line up and you can use Venus, you can use Earth. Um, Mars, whichever in the inner solar system to get out there. So give me some idea about how the team kept working under those conditions, because I haven't been in Aztec for more than a year and a half almost, and, and just on, on the odd day, but teams have to go into the test chambers, they have to go and make all that work. Um, I'm not sure the science side was necessarily so important to be there on site, but the, the, the engineers were. No, but similarly to what uh, Michel said on the on the project side and industry side, the priority was given to people in, in doing a lab experiment and testing and yeah. building hardware. So, for example, in the in general, in the in the in the laboratories at Estec, there were still people uh, working while the majority of us were teleworking. So that was uh, that was one point. And the, ind and the industry uh, all across Europe also they managed very well given the restrictions. Uh, they got also some priority uh, and they manage very well. I mean, it's another way of working and a big congratulations to the team because they, we, we have accumulated a little bit of delay, but considering the, the restriction and this COVID situation, I think it's, a, it's just an ama amazing work what they have been able to, uh, to do on the, on the industry and project side. It's just unbelievable. And, 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 you know, for, I think for me, that just showed how well we were working together as a team across all of the teams, across the ESA engineers and the Airbus engineers as well, because my engineers couldn't actually travel. So we were able to send the instrument for testing, but they couldn't go with it. And so the ESA engineers would be running the tests for us and they would be sending us WhatsApp messages telling us what was going going on and that was the way that we were able to keep in touch so it was it was how it how everyone really just did whatever they could to make sure that we could we could get to launch on time 
So I wanted to come back. The question I was going to ask before, um, when I was lucky enough, I did go into Aztec recently. Uh, Olivia, you invited me in to actually go and see Juice while it was in the clean room. And I know, you know, a lot of you've done that with lots of people. And that's been fantastic because it's always important to see the spacecraft. I mean, I'm kind of worried that, Michelle, you may not actually. Well, maybe you'll get to see it before uh, it flies. I'm know. sure. I'm sure you will. <laughs> we'll organize something. I mean, for me, James Webb Space Telescope, I haven't seen it for five years and I yeah. will never see it probably right before it launches um, yeah. so there's something emotional about that but you were telling me about something which i think it's probably not generally wide knowledge yet which i think is truly spectacular possibility um we'll see how it turns out next year on timing but that is that we have these flybys uh, using venus but most of them are at the earth but but in one of the trajectories one of those flybys isn't actually the earth at all so tell us what that what i what i'm alluding to there yeah, yeah. So uh, in one of the trajectory, one year after launch, we uh, there will be a, in principle an Earth flyby, but it's a very special Earth flyby, which we, it's it is it is called in fact a lunar Earth flyby gravity assist, and it's very special. I think it's the first time we uh, we will do that. The uh, the colleagues at Hizok who who build the trajectory, they they managed to find a very interesting opportunity. So rather than doing a normal Earth gravity assist, they will use the Moon. Uh, to change the trajectory of the spacecraft, then, as we said before, to get, to get more energy and velocity to go to Jupiter. And in that particular case, the, the, the moon flyby will be only at 300 kilometer altitude. And then we'll go further away from the Earth at something like 200,000 kilometers. But the moon flyby itself, uh, I think, will be quite spectacular. And uh, hopefully, we will take uh, some images and maybe some. Uh, some other data with the with the instrument we have to see that but just from the trajectory point of view i think it will be a, a world premiere and yes i look forward to it <laughs> yeah, you, you showed me the movie this week and it's amazing with the moon in the foreground the spacecraft passing over the top of the moon and then the sun and the earth in the background so unfortunately it looks if, if that it holds it looks like the moon won't be sunlit and neither will the earth but we've been looking and I've been going through some old Rosetta data to see what you can see of the the night lights on the Earth mm -hmm. on the night side, and 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 I just calculate even from the distance of the Moon, the Earth is bigger than the field of view of the camera, so uh, of the main science camera on board. So using the webcams, the the kind of smaller color cameras on board, and the main science camera, well, it, 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 there should be some really amazing. Pictures yeah, no, it's there. a good input. We we are we are pre preparing at the moment uh, what kind of observations we can do during the cruise phase, and that will be a uh, one interesting uh, moment for sure. Yeah, and and, and, yeah, and uh, sorry, sorry, bring, sorry yeah, Mark, um, the um, the Earth flybys that we that we are going to do are really important for the magnetometer instrument because what we do because we know the magnetic field of the Earth really 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 sort of well we use those flybys to help us calibrate the instrument and make sure that what we're actually measuring is what the instrument is seeing so yeah. those are really important for us as well yeah. now you, you got exactly the question i was going to ask because you know once the launch has gone by you've sure you've got yeah. seven years holiday right you've got nothing to do uh, i mean there is that of course there's that piece past the the earth flyby i don't know i mean let, let's go back to rosetta we've often talked about it in, in space rocks um there is a big technical difference uh, about about juice compared to other spacecraft which have gone to the kind of let's call it the mid and outer solar system and it's not using nuclear power it's using very big um, solar panels the biggest solar panels i think probably on any spacecraft that have flown um, but there's no there's no hibernation phase or anything right it's going to be able to operate through the last earth flyby to jupiter but i presume not a lot of science happens but we do fly past an intro through an interesting piece of the solar system at that point, right, Olivier? Uh, yes, the asteroid belt. Yeah. So first, uh, the first thing will be to make sure we don't bump into an asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> There's your Star Wars link, Alex, right? Yeah. That will be, uh, that's just a spacecraft uh, safety. Uh, but besides that, yes, so uh, we are sure we are going to pass the, with the five flyby, so four for the Earth, um, plus the one at Venus. 
And it might well be that uh, there, there will be an asteroid or two, which will, will not be too far from uh, from from Zeus. We have to see that. That will depend on the on the launch date, of course, the launch performance, the trajectory, the fuel that we have on board. So once we uh, we launch, we'll see. We we have a better idea of the of the fine uh, trajectory, and it might well be that there will be an asteroid or two at which uh, from Zeus for a flyby. So that we have to see. And we have to see uh, how close we can go to, to such an asteroid. We have to see uh, if we want to fine tune the trajectory, we have to, to, uh, to decide if we want to spend some propellant uh, to do this flyby. And propellant is really a, a big thing because we need propellant to achieve all the milestone of the mission, including uh, the Ganymede phase. We want to reach a final orbit even at 200 kilometers. So we need to have as much propellant as possible. So we have to see if during the cruise we can afford a little bit of uh, of propellant to uh, to make an asteroid fly by. But it's it's a possibility at the moment. Cool. I wonder if we could flip back um, briefly to something that was mentioned and it's you know, come up because of course we have people joining us all over the place and and something I was ruminating on. Um, you said early on, Michelle, an important distinction was made about when the um, project proposal was put together. You weren't there searching for life, but for habitability. Why is that distinction important in terms of how you present the proposal and in terms of how I suppose you define, you know, uh, the, the mission and so on? Because it, it's perhaps a nuance that I don't fully appreciate. Um, Alec, I, th I always I always try and be very careful that we don't overpromise. And so um, for us to say that we were going to search for life or we were planning to find life, that, that means something very different to most people, I think, than searching for the ingredients for life. Um, I very much hope we will be able to go and search for life sometime in the future, but we need to, we need to get our head around where the best place in the solar system to, to, to actually do that is. And once we've decided, I mean, you know, we might decide Ganymede is the place to go, but then having an orbiting spacecraft will allow us to work out where we might want to land in the future. The same thing is for Europa Clipper as well. And so I think I was just trying to make sure that we were being honest um, and not over and not over promising what we would be able to do. Um, so that for me was really quite important. I don't know. Um, if I if I describe that well, Olivier, whether you might whether you might have oh. described it differently. No, no, no. I think uh, that's perfect. We 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 need to be to be honest, and at the same time to sell uh, a fantastic mission. So I think this is what you did a few years ago when there was the selection. So uh, I think just to put a, a, a kind of a slightly more cynical spin on it, if you had oversold it. Uh, the astronomers would have ripped you to pieces, right? Because it's competitive. And, and I was on the, I was not working for ESA in 2009 and I was on the Space Science Advisory Committee. And these are exactly the kinds of things you look for. I mean, it's not about knocking science down. It's about making sure that what you're selecting is what can be delivered. Um, uh, because because if you overpromise in the science community and then come back from it, others will say, well, we could have done something better. And you just don't want that. You don't want that discussion in the science community. And you don't want it in the general public either, where people say, but you promised me, you promised me this, you promised me that. But I, I wanted, <laughs> because I just want to remind everybody, Olivier has not only worked on JUICE, but he's worked on Mars missions, on Cassini-Huygens and other things. And uh, so, come, come on, Olivier, we're getting close to the end of, of the chat now. Really, Jupiter? Come on, Mars is surely where everything's at, right? I mean, that's where we're going to find life if we're going to do anything. So are you kind of, you know, have you given up being a Martian now? No, 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 no. I'm not giving up. I mean, now, now I'm taking care also of the as part of my of my job of the of the project scientists in all the solar system missions. So I keep an eye on all the missions and Venus also now. Uh, but no, Mars it's still a very very interesting place. I think what is interesting with the with the moon of Jupiter. I mean, if you consider Mars, uh, the idea was to uh, to uh, to uh, to discover the water. Where is the water on Mars? So we send Mars Express with the radar to find the water underneath the surface. We failed for the during the first years. Now two years ago there was a, an interesting publication uh, about uh, subsurface water, which is being again uh, challenged by uh, recent publications, even this week. Oh. Uh, 
So the story of water on Mars is not very clear. What is clear from, uh, from Mars Express and other missions is that there was water on, on Mars in the past, but now it's not, it's not very clear. While, uh, as we explained during, uh, during uh, tonight, uh, there is a lot of water in the, inside the moon of Jupiter. So that makes them quite, uh, quite interesting. So uh, because if we want to study a life possibility for life habitability, we need to, to find the water. So at least in the moons of Jupiter at Europa and Ganymede, we know there is a lot of water and maybe at Callisto. Yeah. So I think uh, that makes mm. those worlds quite uh, fascinating to explore. And, and, and Mark, if I could follow up just sure. briefly, we think that Ganymede and its internal structure um, by us understanding that better, we will then understand a lot better moons of exoplanets, um, other other moons in the solar system. We think there are lots of water type worlds in the solar system and beyond. And so it's almost that by going to Ganymede, all the, all the stuff we've talked about this evening, we really want to do, but it'll also allow us to better understand a water world type body mm. in other in other places in the universe as well so so this point about mars and and life on mars potentially there is a connection to the outer solar system as well because of course there's always this slight concern and it's not purely philosophical that mars and earth could actually share the same life because things fly between earth and mars there are martian meteorites on the planet earth there will be lumps of earth on the surface of mars but that's actually true everywhere in the solar system you can just do it statistically and work out there are bits of earth and there are bits of mars on the ice of on the top of the ice at ganymede uh, not maybe not very much but there's you know there's been enough big impacts in the inner solar system that there's tiny amounts of stuff everywhere but but remind us again how thick is that ice at ganymede it's not going to have worked its way down is it and polluted the ocean underneath i mean i just give us a sense about the scale because when we talk about oceans on the earth we know that it goes down to 10 11 kilometers deep and we have the highest mountains you know eight eight kilometers nine kilometers above that we're talking about very different scales on ganymede aren't we well, the crust on the, on ganymede of course we don't know the exact number this is why also we sent uh, juice and the laser altimeter will be able to answer to this question uh, yeah. But we think it's in order of uh, 40 to, to 60 kilometers, something like that. But again, of, plus of, minus of, uh, of, of ice. Of, that's, of that's, ice. That's, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But that we don't know the exact value. But that's the order of magnitude, what we think. Uh, for the, uh, then for the liquid water underneath, I think it's more between 100 and 200 kilometers. I don't know, Michel, what... Uh, what you know, but that Michel will give the, the answer with uh, the magnetometer data. <laughs> it certainly, it certainly hope so. That's what we're aiming to do. Yeah, Mark, what, what, we, what we know about the ocean at Ganymede is based on the Galileo mag, mag ob, observations. Um, and there, because they didn't have an, data at lots of difference in juicing frequencies, all they were able to say was that the if the salt water content is similar to that on the Earth, then the ocean is about a hundred about a hundred kilometers in in sort of height. So we we want to try and make that make two different unique observations, one of the salt water content, and therefore work out what the what the actual depth is to. So so how does it re retain? How does it stay liquid? Even I mean, at some point the pressure must get so great that it turns back into ice again. Is that why Ganymede is thought to be ice water ice and Europa's smaller, so it never quite gets to that pressure before it hits the core. I th I think that's part of it, but I think also it's to do with the orbital resonances of the different moons as well. Um, because, and I'm gonna don't know if I can describe this in the time that we've got that we've got left, but the 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 four moons of Jupiter are in the Laplace resonance. So when when Io orbits once, Europa orbits twice or vice versa but it's it they you know they they all they they all they all affect each other's interiors as a result of where they are with respect to their orbits around jupiter so i think that's part of it as well okay but but this you know it seems insane to think about it on the planet earth a uh, hundred kilometer deep ocean and of course that's yeah. only because our oceans we don't have more space to fit water in right we actually have a very thin layer of water whereas right. if you make something mostly out of water you could have it much thicker uh, we also want to try and work uh, work out if the ganymede ocean is a global one 
yeah. or whether it's just in sort of pockets, that's something else we Because that Because that has changed multiple times with Enceladus, hasn't it? At times, Enceladus has been thought to be a full layer, a decoupled ice shell at the top with water kind of lubricating it, and at other times, I think today it's global, if I'm, if I'm right about Enceladus, that's the current thing. That, that's right, and that's based mainly on the, on the gravity observa observations. I think there's some recent papers that have come out on that, yeah. Right. So, Alex, maybe you've got some questions from the from the audience. We're on the top of the hour. We're, we're okay to stay on as long as, as you guys are for another 10, 15 minutes, if that's okay. But Well, we've, uh, we've, we've got uh, people asking all kinds of incredibly informed questions, but it's a well-rounded conversation, so they're already being answered in, in some cases. <laughs> um, so um, I've got a question um, for Olivier. Um, if you could tell us a little bit more about the actual, the, the launch vehicle. Um, you know, that's actually, you know, putting this up and so on. What are we looking forward to? What are, what are we going to see next year? So the low, the you mean the rocket, huh? Yes. Yeah, yeah the the rocket will be uh, an Ariane five. And what could what could be interesting? We have to see which which one, but we might get the last one. <laughs> <laughs> because you know there is a there is a transition between. I mean that's his here. It's a European uh, programmatic and industry, etc. So that we have a transition between Ariane five and Ariane six, which is happening right now. So uh, with JUICE, with the JUICE project, uh, it was decided that we, we would like to use an Ariane 5 for, for many, many reasons. And then we may get the last one. So if, if there is a launch delay, uh, for example, in 2023, then we, we might be forced to, uh, to use an Ariane 6 because Ariane 5 might, might stop. We have to see how the development is, is, is going. So, but uh, in principle, we launched with the Ariane 5 from, uh, from Kourou. So it will be a, a night launch. So always interesting. So and uh, for as any launch event, it will, it will be a big, uh, a big event, in particular for the people who have been working <laughs> many, many years on this on this project. I mean, we, we have a, in 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 space missions, we have a, a few critical events, and the launch is a particular one. The other one will be the 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 orbit insertion around around Jupiter. So we have this kind of uh, event, which are short in time, but uh, very intense. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> you know, I, I guess we should never forget that um, you know, there are human beings behind this, and I'm sure for many, it will be an incredibly emotional moment, just the start of that journey. I mean, if we could talk about a different kind of journey, we have a great question from Charlotte for Michelle. Um, you know, who wants to talk about what would your advice be to someone who wants to move in the direction of becoming a PI? You know, you're talking about training, you know, um, you know, future generations and so on. What does that entail? And, and what would you advise them? What direction should they move in? Um, say yes to things that might frighten you. Um, when I first arrived at Imperial College, almost 30 years ago now, I'm sort of dating myself. Um, I was asked by the, 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 the PI at the time on the Cassini magnetometer instrument whether I wanted to cover for him when he went to ESA on a secondment. And I thought, is he crazy? I can't do this. And it turned out that I could. And so he saw something in me that I didn't know I had. I was terrified to start with. So I think the first thing is be brave and do things you don't think you can do. Um, but for me, the most important thing is to surround yourself by a really good team. Work with people who are better than you at some things. And so as a, as a, as a team, you can really come together um, and take chances, I think, Charlotte. They're, you know, If an opportunity presents itself to you, go for it and ask for as much help as you need to be able to follow through on it. Fantastic advice. Um, great advice for life as well, I think. You know, whatever you're doing, yeah, be brave, take risks, and uh, say yes to things that don't, uh, well, maybe take you out of the comfort zone. Um, yeah. we, we, we have a, we have a, um, a few more. Um, it, it, the, I guess this is a great question from Detlef. He's saying, ESA recently selected moons of the giant planets as one of the mission themes for Voyage 2050. What can you tell us about that as a concept? What sort of... Um, other sorts of missions are, are coming within the broader framework of, of I guess, this, this big chapter in, in ESA's history. It, it might be one for Mark. 
Yes, so the yeah, Olivia. Oh, yeah, 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 maybe for Mark. Yeah, no, no, you're on the inside of this, Olivia. Yeah, you go. You no, no, I mean you are. No, you, you, you know, you know probably more than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, obviously the Jupiter moons are exciting and interesting um, in and of themselves, but there are people who are you know really excited about going back to the moons at Saturn, um, going back to uh, Titan, where, of course, the Huygens probe landed. Uh, and NASA are doing that. NASA are going to fly Dragonfly to go yeah. there. Um, and, and that'll be an amazing thing to see a sort of quadcopter flying around. It's a very dense atmosphere on Titan. It's the only other place, basically, with a kind of a rocky hard surface and a dense atmosphere in the solar system, uh, which is safer, safer than Venus anyway, uh, like the Earth. Um, but Enceladus, you know, should we go back there again? I mean, we were talking about the thickness of the ice at um, at Ganymede, uh, you know, being 40, 50 kilometers. And Enceladus, we know in some locations, it's very thin because water's coming out. In fact, it, there are gaps. So could you could you go in and, and land on the surface? But, you know, Neptune and Uranus, they have very interesting moons as well going further out. But these these outer planet missions are very challenging because then you are talking nuclear power. You can't really even get to Saturn with with solar power. So you've got to talk about alternate power sources. And that has its own baggage in Europe because, uh, you know, the opposition of some member states uh, to using nuclear power on spacecraft. Um, and, you know, there, there's even discussion now at a high level about bringing samples back from one of these places, a cryogenic sample return mission, which might be able to bring back the surface, a piece of the surface of something like Europa or Ganymede. Now, it's not easy. You know, it's, it's one thing to go into orbit. That's hard enough. But to go down to the surface, bring something and get back up again is a whole nother kettle of fish, right? I mean, you've got that you got to kill the energy getting down to the surface, and then you've got to get, get back up off the surface again with energy. So I think there are lots of interesting things. Olivier, you know, you, you, you're also, you've got the project scientists and the study scientists who will start looking into this. Where do you think the, you know, from the science community perspective, where are the priorities going to be, given that JUICE is going? Um, Titan is going to get some coverage. I mean, you know, maybe we want a submarine on Titan floating around in the... Yeah, the well, that will be uh, certainly where I was very interested to get this news that the, the next big mission will be uh, two moons at uh, Saturn or Jupiter. And the next uh, months or years will be quite interesting because indeed we are going to define what the mission will be uh, without knowing what will be the result of JUICE. Yeah. So we need to think about that without, uh, uh, I mean, usually when we build a mission after another one, you wait, the mission is over and then you get the result and you sink to the next mission. In that case, we will need to think already to uh, where to go, uh, what to find, uh, what kind of mission, etc. right now. So that will be an interesting exercise. And we will get the, the, the feeling and the ideas and the input from the scientific communities. Uh, so what is open is that it will be uh, it could be moons of Jupiter or moons of Saturn. It could be multiple moons. It could be an orbital mission. It could be a lander. Uh, you mentioned submarine. I don't know if we will be able to to uh, to make submarine, but that could be uh, could be interesting. A, a few years ago, I was contacted by a by an ind industry building a submarine. And they wanted to know more about the oceans in the in the moons of Jupiter, just to know if they could start to think about the submarine. So it's uh, it's uh, it's already uh, the industry. They already think about it. So yeah, the, the coming uh, the coming years will be quite interesting. I have no idea where we will go, uh, but I'm really looking forward to the to the discussion for sure. A final question for me, and this is one that's been nagging at me. And um, well, I've got to ask because uh, I think a few other people might want to know as well. Why juice? <laughs> I mean, I know why Jews, right? You know, but it, it's just, you know, the, the, the naming conventions, the things that, you know, happen across different missions is absolutely fascinating to me. Did people just sit around maybe in the mythical um, uh, kitchen table conversation and so on and just, and so, okay, we're, it's not going to be a person. It's not going to be what it does. It's just, this is, this is what it is. Perhaps gesturing over to the fridge. I have no idea. I just wondered if you might have that story. Mark, should I take a first stab at it? Well, you, you, you take a first stab and I'll tell you whether you're telling the truth or not. <laughs> I, I feel like I've stepped into a bigger... Oh, haven't you just? <laughs> so, um, Alex, when we... Um, I was, I was uh, on the science definition team, the joint science def definition team between ESA and NASA when we were studying the joint um, plans. 
And when when NASA withdrew, ESA turned to the Europeans on the study team and said, you've got three months to come up with an ESA only idea. And oh, by the way, we want you to change the name. So we spend long hours coming up with a new idea for a spacecraft and the, and what we would do with it. And we didn't really have time to spend much time thinking about the actual name. And so the study team went to a pub one evening after a really long day of work. And we came up with a list of about five different names. Um, Juice was quite low down the list. And, you know, it stands for Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. And you've got to really concentrate to be able to get that out. And it turns out some of the names higher up on the list had either been used before or someone at ESA didn't like them. So... We ended up with Juice, and then we were told by people, that's a dreadful name. And now people are saying, we love the name. We never want you to change it. So, okay, Mark, what did I, <laughs> what did I get wrong? <laughs> I don't think, no, 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 you didn't get anything wrong. I just think it was kind of an interesting moment from, from the inside perspective at ESA. Of course, the mission originally yep. was called Laplace, and this is yep. named for a scientist in the very classical way. And it made a lot of sense. As you mentioned, there are, there are you know, reasons uh, that that scientist should be honoured. But when you descope a mission and you change its w- what it's going to be completely, not a collaborative one with NASA, so therefore a smaller mission, if you keep using the same name, I think the argument from our side was you're kind of selling something under the old banner when it's not really the same mission. And, you know, so I remember being ambivalent about that, but I can see I can see the rationale. But then when I heard Juice, I thought... Michelle's chosen that deliberately, that it's a terrible name, so that there's no way that it will survive until launch. And at some point, something will come back in. And and here we are a year from launch, and I suspect the chances of it being changed now, because we're all used to it. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to say, but, you know, there is a Japanese tradition, of course, of, of, of having a name of a mission all the way until launch. And when it's successfully launched, changing it to something uh, as a kind of a... You, you know, in a way, you don't want to burn a name up on something which may crash, if you know what I mean, right? So the Japanese do it for that reason. I, you know, I'm definitely going off the record, and nobody in Eastern management watches this anyway. I would be quite happy with a name change if something happened and came along, because it also provides an additional momentum. But Juice is kind of funky as well, right? I mean, it only shows the European spirit that only Europeans could choose something as terrible a name as Juice. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I've only been European for the last 30 years. I come from South Africa before that. So we, we, we like to mix things up a bit. <laughs> so Olivier's but, smiling. I'm sure he knows even more. But, yeah, we, we'll see what happens in the next 12 months. There is nothing cooked up. I know nothing about a name change. We've had this discussion about other missions in the last in the 10 years I've been with ESA, 12 years. You know, shall we rename this to something which is a little bit more adventurous than, you know, the black box going to planet Y or something, right? We've had a few of those. And uh, Mars Express. I mean, it went to Mars and it was it, it went fast. But come on, is that the best you could come up with, Olivier? Mars Express? Um, it, but you know <laughs> what I mean. So we, we'll see. We'll see with Juice. But, we'll uh, see. It's, it's but kind there, of... So there you go, Alex. You really did stir up the hornet's nest. <laughs> <laughs> Way slowly. No comment. All it is. <laughs> The merchandising <laughs> potential of Juice is tremendous, okay? But uh, look, Olivier and Michelle, what an absolute pleasure it was to join you. We'll be watching really closely. And, and I, I'm sure that I speak for everybody who watched tonight and uh, everyone at Space Rocks, including Mark. We'd love to have you back and hear more as we near this phenomenal, phenomenal moment of discovery for us all. So thank you so much for your time tonight. And before you go, as, as threatened, or as, as invited, Mark, it's, uh, it's tradition now. The moment of truth. So Olivier's already practiced, and and Michelle, you you, you must you probably watched in. So we we finish off with a hand signal. This is "Live Long and Prosper" from the Star Trek uh, film. So therefore, space and rocks, space and rocks. There you go. Yeah, you've got the the sellotape there to move your fingers apart. Very good. <laughs> so thank you very much both for joining us this evening. And as thank Alex you very says, much. it would be great to have you. Obviously, we we started Uplink a year ago as something to do to keep things going on Space Rocks during lockdown. And we've enjoyed it, but we want to go back to the live events as well. So, you know, at the, the time, by the time of the Juice launch uh, next year, let's hope that there's an event around it and we can invite you both there to uh, come and tell the, the audience so. directly about what's going on. That'd be great. 
Thank you very much. Nice to nice to spend the evening with you. Take care. (laughs) All right. Thanks very much. Bye now. Bye. 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 Very good. Well then, Mark, um, uh, fascinating, and I think I stepped on a bit of a landmine at the end. (laughs) Well, uh, yeah, I should have said perhaps. Well, no, look, you know, science science involves people, and it involves people you know, in all sorts of cultural ways. And, and, you know, to be told you can't use that name on your mission, well, people are going to react in a kind of an interesting way. But uh, mm-hmm. so we are where we are and we'll see what happens in the next year. But uh, yeah, it's a good well, topic. Fascinating insight into the, uh, the the mission, the science, but also the people and the culture behind it all, yeah. which I think is just as fascinating. And I think that what Space Rocks does so well is it, it humanizes something that can sometimes feel very distant indeed. And, and I think tonight is proof positive. Just what what lovely people. And, uh, well, next year is going to be exciting for so many reasons. Uh, there's a lot going on. And, uh, you know, Juice is a big part of that for us. And uh, the payoff comes later, obviously, when we get and, and we'll see where Space Rocks is in seven or nine years time from now. But, uh, yeah, it, there's a long wait. But the big moment, certainly to get it off the ground, is uh, coming quickly. Indeed. And we never stop. We never really talk about 2010. All these worlds are yours, except Europa. There you go. Well indeed so uh jupiter turning into a if you haven't seen the film it's too you know i'm allowed spoilers 30 years after the fact jupiter turning into another star is a pretty pretty impressive piece of astro engineering we're not quite there at ec yet but you know who knows in the future yeah, indeed. all right mark an absolute pleasure we'll talk to you very soon indeed all right thanks very much thanks bye-bye